Good morning, everyone. Um, the laptop that I was going to read from is over there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to have to look at the screen, so I shall orientate myself. Um, I don't have Matt Ritchie's laser focus. Um, he was able to detect the name of a pub at about 400 metres last night, which was highly impressive, but I can't quite read the laptop from here. So, um, so I'm, I'm John Berry. Um, I'm one of CADU's senior inspectors of ancient monuments and archaeology, and I have responsibility for our heritage crime and the kind of policy area. Um, this lovely mess up here is um, something I just want you to keep in mind during this presentation, which is about kind of consequences. Uh, this is St. David's Bishop's Palace, and uh, this was quite a high-grade automotive paint uh, that was sprayed uh, in the undercroft. Um, I just spotted there's a lucky Roman symbol there for apologies if I've offended anyone. Um, and uh, it's, it's quite hard to get off, so you need to understand the substrate that it's been sprayed onto and then the actual chemistry of the paint in order to um, have an effective um, removal. And obviously that has time and cost, which we could be uh, investing in other things. Um, but we're going to have a look at heritage protection developments in Wales over the last um, couple of decades. So I'll quickly introduce CADU. I'll talk about the pre-2016 situation. That will become clear in a minute why that's important. We'll look at the, um, the 2016 Act uh, and then our role today. Uh, Operation Heritage Cymru, which is a, a police-led initiative across the whole of Wales. Uh, the Heritage Crime MOU, and we'll conclude with uh, a couple of case studies and some learning points. So CADU's Welsh Government's Historic Environment Service. We designate historic assets, so we uh, deal with scheduled monuments and listed buildings, protected wrecks and so on, but I'm looking mostly at scheduled monuments today. And we deal with all sorts of um, casework arising from that. Now, we're a really small team. Um, we have six inspectors, five field monument wardens, and we're all involved with heritage crime across Wales. Um, and we also have a casework team um, who kind of beaver away in the background, without which we, we couldn't function. We're part of the civil service. We don't have any powers of investigation or of prosecution. So we're reliant on others to, to do that. So. Natural Resources Wales, local authorities, they have powers, we don't. So we're, we're kind of two steps removed. It's important to realise that responsibility for archaeology is devolved in Wales, but law and order, policing, they're not devolved issues. And we're reliant on the police to investigate and enforce, and the Crown Prosecution Service to um, take cases to court. Um, so, so our role is very much a, a supporting one. So again, looking at consequences, um, this is uh, Tumbalam um, in uh, just north of Newport in, in South Wales. Um, we have lots of issues with deliberately set wildfires in the South Wales valleys. And here we're looking at kind of the consequences of um, quite a a big burn, a, a deep burn that went down to the bedrock in many places. And you can see here, uh, what, 3,250 square metres of reseeding on the, the flat levels was required after this burn. Um, the areas which are more kind of, uh, kind of steeper, uh, they had to be hydro seeded and that was more like 14,500 square metres. So really significant consequences um, from one small action. And this is something that's um, ongoing at the moment. This is a, a, a scheduled late medieval bridge just outside Bridge End. And we've had uh, somebody on site with a sledgehammer knocking out the dress stone um, on the, the cut waters, um, which is a concern because that then exposes the core work. And when we have flooding, the hydraulic pressure can easily start to bring the the bridge apart. Happily, there's a scheduled monument consent application um, that we've just determined for other conservation works on the bridge. Um, so we'll be able to tackle uh, this as part of that project. So the pre-2016 situation. We recognise from the 1979 Act 
that um, prosecution is a deterrent and that Welsh ministers and, and CADU is part of the civil service, so there's, there's no legal differentiation between us and Welsh ministers, um, have to refer cases to the police to investigate and to CPS to prosecute. But successful prosecutions were very, very rare. So as part of the, the work to um, justify changes in the legislation, our legislation policy team did a review of the number of uh, damage cases that were recorded uh, between 2006 and um, 2012. And you can see there were 119 recorded cases and there are uh, a minimum of 17 substantial failures to comply with scheduled monument consent conditions. Only four cases were reported to the police and one went to court where we had a successful prosecution but a relatively small fine. So not really much of a deterrence there. Where are the teeth for this legislation? Now, the lack of evidence that the accused knew of the protected status of the monument was a valid defence in law. And it was very commonly kind of wheeled out, and that's why the prosecution, prosecution rate was so low. So during the development of the bill, we uh, undertook uh, consultations, um, and uh, many of the respondents expressed their concern about you know, the dis dissatisfaction with the, the situation, um, the, the low number of prosecution. Now, this defense of ignorance was raised by a number of respondents, um, and we took kind of legal advice on this. And whilst it can't be removed, it's something that kind of we wanted to, to weaken so that people couldn't wheel out this excuse in court. So the 2016 Act amended the defense of ignorance, in the, uh, which is implicit in the 1979 Act. Um, concerning the status or location of a protected monument. Um, and uh, they, they have to show now that they've taken all reasonable steps to identify whether uh, a monument is legally protected or not. So as a result of the, the new legislation which came into force in 2017, um, a lack of knowledge of the status or the location of a scheduled monument um, is only permitted uh, for a, a Section 2 offence, so that's kind of unauthorised works, um, if they can prove that they've taken all reasonable steps to be, find out if there was a scheduled monument that would be affected by those works. And then in Section 28, damage cases, uh, again, uh, this is to do with intentional damage or destruction of a uh, protected monument. Uh, they have to... Uh, show that they knew or reasonably ought to have known that a monument was, was protected. And we had additional provisions as well, um, temporary stop notice, uh, notices, scheduled monument enforcement notices, um, which were designed to uh, prevent harm um, and also to uh, a formal mechanism to enforce unfulfilled scheduled monument consent conditions. Um, and as, as part of this package, we published our designated data sets online through Cov Cymru, which is, you can see up on the slide there. Um, and you can see that the, the locations, the extents and the boundaries of the scheduled areas are kind of depicted for everyone to see. So that's available on your computer. It's available on your smartphone. So again, it weakens that uh, excuse of uh, well, I didn't know. So our role today, um, we're advocates for reduction in, in heritage crime. So we represent Wales uh, at a strategic level uh, across the UK, uh, working with the National Police Chiefs Council, um, the CPS uh, and other partners. We um, develop, we're in government, so we develop um, legislation, policy and guidance. We liaise with the uh, Wales Heritage Crime 
um, police lead. Um, and the, we're lucky in Wales, full police forces, so um, we can uh, often make sure that things are consistent across Wales. We also work with a lot of sectorial partners, um, loads of projects which are ongoing, which I'd love to mention, which I can't because of the time. So uh, if I don't mention you, uh, please don't take offence. And we're working across portfolios as well. So we have um, the Wales Wildlife and Rural Crime Group. So there's an overlap there with Heritage Crime. We work with Board Force and also um, the Joint Arson Group with the three fire and rescue services in Wales. We provide a lot of heritage crime training. So we're raising awareness of um, the historic environment, how it can be harmed and uh, what we need to do to protect it. And we're supporting various heritage watch schemes um, and communities. We also provide reports um, and specialist advice to the police regarding offences to schedule monuments. And we have 131 monuments in state care. Um, they are subject to antisocial behaviour, damage, vandalism, um, arson, all those kind of things. So um, we're working on strategies with the police to protect those places as well. Um, so Operation Heritage Cymru, um, this is a uh, police-led um, activity, uh, bringing together the, uh, the four Welsh police forces um, and making sure that there's a consistency of approach in terms of raising awareness and um, tackling heritage crime in Wales. So we have a supporting role um, in this. Um, the, the actual initiative was uh, launched at one of our properties uh, back in 2022. Um, on the slide, you can see um, we've got cadets and other kind of volunteers involved as well. So it's across the, the police family. And uh, a quote here from the, the then um, single point of contact for heritage crime in, in Wales, Inspector Ruben Palin, who retired last October. People are rightly proud of their heritage, but unfortunately, there is a minority that don't give it the respect it deserves. Heritage crime is a serious issue that can have a serious negative effect on our communities. This is um, a, a slide that they put together for Op Heritage Cymru, and you can kind of see the, the six main things that they were hoping to achieve. So they want consistency um, of advice and approach across all the four Welsh forces. There was an um, initiative to try and drive up the quality of, of uh, heritage crime data. Develop that policing knowledge in quite a specialist area. Raise public awareness. Encourage crime recording. And setting up various community heritage watch schemes. Uh, Mark's mentioned the MOU, um, so I'll skip past this. Um, it's got an impressive title, which I won't read out. Uh, it was signed at Chepstow Castle, um, March last year. Very pleased to be part of it. Um, CADU's been included for the first time. Um, so it was revised to extend to Wales and to include antisocial behaviour for the first time. Just like to point out those two things aren't linked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are. Coincidence. And it's been transformative in terms of how we approach and the support that we get from um, other organisations and colleagues. Nearly killed us though, didn't it? Yeah. Well, the good news is, is that we've got the uh, Historic Environment Wales 23 Act, um, which is going to be coming into force later on this year. And it, as I said there, Appendix 1, that summary of all the heritage crime offences will need to be updated and retranslated uh, in order to um, respect all the new provisions in the Act. Uh, just move on to a couple of case studies. Um, it's not all about prosecution, um, but sometimes you do have to have that element. Um, you do need that press coverage. You do need that deterrence. Um, this is a Canadian civil Roman settlement uh, just outside Newport. Really impressive. Um, Roman legionary fortress there. Um, this is an area of land that we, we purchased. Um, there's uh, some really quite impressive public buildings 
uh, Roman public buildings that have been discovered there, so we secured them for the nation. Um, and then the Jason farmer during lockdown uh, had nothing better to do, so he tipped 6,000 tonnes of material um, onto the scheduled area, uh, including the land that we actually bought ourselves. So I think that's a case of buy one, get one free. Um, you can see it's all spilling down into the River Usk, um, and it was um, kind of ungraded, unsorted um, soil and kind of building rubbish, lots of plastic in it, um, cans and pots and various things. Not what you want on a scheduled monument. And tipping, of course, is an offence under the 1979 Act. So the tipping was reported by the public um, during lockdown in June 2020. It was within the scheduled area. Um, there was no scheduled monument consent given for these works. So we're looking at a, a, a Section 2 unauthorised works offence. As I said, 6,000 tonnes of soil and rubbish. That's an awful lot of lorries going backwards and forwards. So CADU's role was um, for uh, myself and the field monument warden to go out and to undertake site visits to describe um, what had occurred um, and what the impact of that would be on the archaeology within the scheduled area. We had to go out on four separate occasions because the tipping continued, despite being asked politely to, to cease. In the end, we had to use our new power for the temporary stop notice, which um, makes it an additional offence to undertake those works in a 28-day period. And we had to prepare an impact statement. Now, this, because of the value, it was like, I think, one, over one million pounds to remediate the site. It went up to Crown Court rather than going to Magistrates Court. So we had to take um, a witness familiarization training just so we knew how to operate in a, a court environment. Um, I don't know if you've ever done the uh, public inquiry training at Oxford, um, where you get to do that session where you're cross-examined and it's mildly terrifying. Um, <laughs> this is just as terrifying. Um, <laughs> Went to Cardiff Crown Court, uh, September 2022. Um, the individual concerned pleaded guilty um, straight away. And on, on the one hand, that means that you don't have to get cross-examined, which is a plus. On the other hand, you quite want to put that training into action. It's a bit of a negative. Um, but because he pleaded guilty, it also had an impact on the tariff. There was a reduction on the tariff on the sentence that he was given by the, the judge. So four and a half thousand pound fine, um, eighteen hundred pound costs might seem quite light, but he was also instructed that he needed to remove all that material that he had tipped in the scheduled area, um, and that is a seriously expensive operation. So the overall um, impact of that isn't reflected in the, um, the fines there. So this was the first successful Section 2 prosecution in Wales, and there's some learning from it. It was really time consuming. It took two years to get to court, and we had to supply all of our documentation in particular formats. Um, it had to be very exacting. We knew that we were dealing with a lay audience, so uh, that was the police, the CPS, uh, the judge, and the jury. Um, so we had to explain everything from first principles. All those things that we assume that everyone else knows as archaeologists, they get that, explain everything from first principles. And then we had to try and anticipate what the defence was, because that's not shared with you until you actually get into the, the courtroom. Second one, very quickly. Um, this was a prehistoric rock art panel, and uh, we had damage reported to it within the scheduled area. You can see someone's basically dug a trench around this prehistoric rock art panel completely divorced it from its surrounding landscape. So that's a case of deliberate damage, section 28. There's no scheduled monument consent, so potentially also a section two offense. We did a damage and unauthorized work report, prepared an impact statement, went to court in uh, Newport. Again, the individual pleaded guilty, um, given almost the same fine as the, um, the previous offence. Uh, but in this particular case, you can also have a, a custodial sentence. So four-month custodial sentence suspended for two years. 
and the fine was allocated for the archaeological recording for the area that had been damaged and the reinstatement. So that was the first successful Section 28 prosecution in Wales. And again, the learning here is that it's a, it's a higher bar to prove Section 28 offences. So you, again, need to have your arguments well rehearsed and set out for that lay audience. Um, the impact of being at trial was really key. Um, we only found out about the dates fairly late on, and I attended, I got on my motorbike, wasn't looking my best, must be honest, and I then ended up standing up in court and reading out my impact statement, desperately wishing it wasn't 12 pages long. <laughs> um, and the, the prosecution decisions as well, CPS decided we won't go with the Section 2 offence, we'll go with the Section 28 offence. And you're not involved in those conversations, um, so you just kind of get swept along um, by the events. And then just very quickly, some concluding remarks. Um, this new historic environment, Wales Act, the provisions in it, um, are really helpful in terms of us tackling heritage crime. Uh, we're contributing at strategic, operational, and tactical levels. And our role is to um, kind of try and explain the impact and, and prevent uh, heritage crime occurring. We provide training, raise awareness across different stakeholders and our role very much about supporting the police with specialist advice. Um, so a lot's been achieved, but we've still got lots of issues to tackle, um, particularly to do with um, identification, recording, understanding, competence, and confidence in tackling heritage crime. I shall leave there. Thank you.